Good morning, everyone. Um, I assume a lot of folks uh, had a good time last night, so I appreciate uh, you all coming out first thing in the morning for this talk right here. So um, this is somehow the third presentation I'm doing at uh, the Polyglot Gathering this time around. Um, and the topic for my third and last talk today is relearning a heritage language how or how learning Hindi and other languages help make me a better Shanghainese speaker. So after two days of uh, talks here at, uh, at the Polyglot Gathering, I've, I've heard a lot of, been talking to a lot of folks, went to a lot of presentations. And I mean, obviously, as polyglots, one thing that we all have in common is an interest in foreign languages, other people's languages, languages that are new and interesting and exciting to us because they are not what we grew up speaking. But at the same time, I've also noticed that as a part of this process of learning other languages, a lot of people have turned around and taken another look at the languages that they grew up speaking. And sort of, it's a feedback loop. It's like you end up, <coughs> sorry, um, sort of a, gaining a better appreciation just for the concept of languages in general. And a lot of people, a number of talks I've been to, say, about Silesian, about Teochew, there's a talk going on right now about Walloon that I wish I could be at, um, which are all very interesting also just in how they basically, people end up being encouraged to rediscover and re-explore languages that they grew up speaking, or maybe at least grew up hearing. And so people can have a lot of different kinds of relationships to languages, but I guess the three big ones obviously are, well, the two big ones I would say everyone would agree on are native languages and foreign languages. And I feel like in the modern day, an increasing number of people are also encountering this category of languages that it's sort of in between. It's neither fully native because they are not exactly fluent in them, but not completely foreign either. Sort of languages that they grew up hearing that their grandparents spoke or their parents speak, but they themselves do not speak uh, fluently for a variety of reasons, because of uh, migration, because of mass media, education, which discourages certain variants of languages. And so I imagine this is an experience that a lot of people in this room have had as well. It's not necessarily a universal experience, but I feel like it's definitely becoming more and more common, at least especially where I'm from in the United States. This is like a very common phenomenon where people um, will often lose the connection with um, a language of their ancestors. And in my specific case, the languages in question would be English and Mandarin, I would both consider to be native. Mandarin is slightly iffy because I really only started speaking it fluently at the age of 10. I'll get into why in a second. Um, foreign languages, a whole ton that I've tried to learn over the years, Russian, college, Spanish, just everywhere living in New York, Hindi, which I'll get into more detail in a sec as well, German, Swahili, Indonesian, and so on. And at the same time, in my case, um, I've also grown up listening to my parents and my relatives speaking Shanghainese since a very early age, but I never really, oops, sorry, never really um, spoke it very well myself as a child. And before we get into why that's the case, I'll just give you a quick summary of what Shanghainese is. So I already gave a talk yesterday, a workshop where I taught people the nitty gritty details of how Shanghainese works, the phonology and so on. So today it's just a quick summary so you can get a sense of um, what this language is that we're uh, looking at here. So first of all, like all so-called Chinese dialects, it's not really a dialect. It's mutually, oh, I, that's a typo. It should be mutually unintelligible, sorry, uh, with Mandarin. And specifically, Shanghainese is a member of the Wu dialect family which is one of the northernmost uh, southern Chinese dialect groups, dialect in quotation marks. It really should be language, but that's not really the word that people tend to use when talking about this. Uh, Shanghai is a relatively young city by Chinese historical standards, so the Shanghainese city dialect also 
basically developed over the past hundred or so years as a result of migration from neighboring areas, a combination of dialects from Suzhou, Ningbo, Shaoxing, and other nearby towns that tend to have a much longer history. Um, Significantly, Shanghainese is not taught in school or used in formal situations. But at the same time, it's, I, it's not really an endangered language, per se, because usually parents will still pass this language down to their children, and kids in school in informal situations tend to still interact with each other often in Shanghainese. Of course, Mandarin is also becoming increasingly common when there are cases of mixed marriages where one parent does not speak Shanghainese or where a family migrates to Shanghai from some other region and they don't speak Shanghainese, it becomes increasingly common for people to speak Mandarin as well. Uh, in my particular case, both my parents are from Shanghai originally, but I did not really ever become comfortable speaking Shanghainese when I was growing up. And the reason, there's a reason for that, and it's a bit complicated. Uh, so I'll just give you a quick summary of my backstory. Um, so I was uh, born in New York City, um, 1989. The year I was born, my parents had just gotten their PhDs, and they were planning to head straight back to China. But as many of you may know, 1989 wasn't exactly a great year to go back to China from the States. So what we ended up doing is wandering around North America for about 10 years, sort of going from place to place. It wasn't really the original plan, so it was sort of, my parents ended up like changing their minds several times about where they wanted to settle down. We went to Toronto when I was just a month old, LA a bit afterwards, Boston, St. Paul. But then eventually, when I was 10 years old, we did go back to Shanghai, where my parents were originally from. And I went to a local school I started going to local schools there where I caught up on my Mandarin. And basically, in schools, you're not supposed to speak Shanghainese. And since I didn't really speak it that well to begin with, I was sort of disincentivized to actually try to speak it. A few times I would try speaking Shanghainese with people, and my accent would just be slightly off. And I'll get into the details of what exactly made my accent off in a second, but most importantly, none of my friends could actually tell me what was wrong about my accent because normal people don't know linguistic terminology like voiced plosives. So they couldn't really say, yeah, you are, you're pronouncing that plosive with voicing when it shouldn't be, and things like that. Although that was one of the main reasons that my Shanghainese was, uh, sounded inauthentic when I was growing up. So. Eventually, for college, I went back to New York. I live there now. I've been back there for 10 years at this point. That's when I started doing, uh, I did Russian in college, uh, did a whole bunch of other languages, got involved in the polyglot community. And at some point, more recently, in the past five years or so, I finally decided I've learned so many other languages. It, I really should actually give Shanghainese another shot and see if I can actually speak it well now. So. But of course, the same challenge that I had as a kid, some of them were still there. Some of the issues that I had with the language growing up were still a factor. So one big issue I had was pronunciation. So as a lot of you probably know, uh, the letters T and D, for example, there's a few pairs like this, uh, in English and say in French, or in Spanish and Portuguese also, are not really the same sounds. Uh, English to and do, um, and then in French you have do, like everything, all do for uh, soft, sweet. And basically the do's are more or less the same, the two's are not. One is two and one is do. The difference is in English you have a puff of air coming out afterwards. So growing up English speaker, I knew two and do. And, but I also spoke Mandarin, and we have a system of romanizi romanizing Mandarin called pinyin, where we have a letter T and a letter D, but this is their distribution. T, like tu for picture, is the same as English T, but what we write with a D in pinyin for Mandarin is actually the same as a French or Spanish or various other romance, I think, Germanic's different, um, T. So, Du would be like stomach. And my problem as a kid was that 
growing up speaking English and Mandarin and knowing the way it's, these languages are written, I always just assumed that Mandarin D and English D were the same. I couldn't actually distinguish the sounds because I suppose in the case of both English and Mandarin speakers, what we really listen for isn't the voicing. We're not listening for whether or not the vocal cords are vibrating. What we really pick up on, what we learn to pick up on as children learning the language is if there's a puff of air coming out. So to make matters even worse, Shanghainese has uh, three consonants for each position. So for the T position that we're looking at right here, it's du, du for a lot, tu for to drag, and both of the previous uh, characters from the earlier line uh, are voiced like an English D. So that's one of the things that makes a Shanghainese Wu dialects uh, unique among Chinese dialects is that they've preserved this three-way distinction that Middle Chinese had, but Cantonese does not, Mandarin does not, Hokkien has some of these sounds, but in a different distribution, and it's not quite the same. So as a kid, I started getting into linguistics. Everyone else was taking English class at the time, and I just tried to try my hand at Spanish and French uh, when I was in Shanghai, and I came across this fact, and I was absolutely dumbfounded. Like, how, how is this possible? I, I didn't, I can't tell the difference between these sounds. Like, I listened to my parents speak Shanghainese every day, and I had no idea that this is what was going on. So, whenever, this was the main reason that when I tried to speak Shanghainese with my classmates in school, I would come off as having a slightly odd accent. So, like I mentioned, this is the case for the, 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 but also b, p, b, and uh, g, k, g in, uh, in Shanghainese. And one problem I have, um, I'll do this first. So th this was one of the key pairs that I always messed up as a kid. I always thought they were just the same. Gong means to speak, and gong with a voicing is stupid. So um, I had a... F we were talking about something. A friend of mine was saying something like, he says he's stupid. Can you believe it? In Shanghainese would be ikang, ikang, ikang. But, and to me, it just sounded like, oh, the gongs are all the same. Like, I don't really hear a difference here. But actually, they're not the same. So whenever I tried to speak Shanghainese, I would sound stupid because I didn't know the difference between speaking and being stupid in Shanghainese, apparently. Um, Another thing that, uh, so this was the problem I had with Shanghainese, and I quickly came to discover that many other languages in the world have similar distinctions, are even worse and more complicated distinctions than that. For example, Hindi. A lot of other Indo-Aryan languages have du, tu, du. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm trying to use real words here. So dur is like far. And uh, is sunlight, like sunshine, I think. So they have all three sounds that Shanghainese has, plus like another one where you're both vibrating your vocal cords and having a puff of air come out at the end. So at some point, like late in high school, I sort of decided, OK, I'm never going to learn Hindi. I can, I'm not going to learn Shanghainese. I'm just going to stick to languages that maybe have like two of these consonants and hope I can just like get by and people won't notice that I'm, I'm actually mispronouncing things. Um, so yeah, like I did Russian, I did a bunch of Slavic languages, whatever, European languages. You can get away with not actually distinguishing these sounds very well. And at the time, I had this idea, I, I'd read it somewhere, that um, people always talk about how after a certain age you can't learn languages. I didn't believe that, but I did believe that after a certain age it becomes impossible to properly distinguish sounds anymore, which led me to believe that I would actually just never be able to speak Shanghainese properly. So I sort of stopped trying. But, OK, these are the same slide. Um, so I graduated college. I got a job in uh, IT, a programmer at an investment bank. And half my coworkers spoke Hindi. So um, they found out that I was like a big language person. I enjoyed learning a lot of languages early on during the training program when we first started working, I was like talking to people in Arabic and Serbian and Russian and Spanish and French and whatnot. And they would just be like, Kevin, why don't you speak the world's second largest language? 
to which I responded, okay, first of all, Hindi is actually the fourth largest language, but also you have a good point, actually. Um, I will now try to learn Hindi. Um, because honestly, Hindi was like, languages of India in general were something I'd always been interested in maybe trying to learn, but I just figured it would be too difficult for me to actually distinguish the sounds. But at this point, now that I had a group of friends and coworkers who all spoke Hindi who could help me with the language, I decided I would give it another shot. So I spent a few years working on the language, knowing that I would have difficulty potentially with the proper pronunciation of these various consonants. So I made sure to put extra effort into distinguishing those and getting a hang of that. And in a sort of roundabout way, this, among a number, number of other things, helped me eventually become better at Shanghainese because I had learned various other skills through, my, through the process of learning all sorts of other languages. So, um, yeah, these are some of the things that uh, learning other languages helped me with Shanghainese in. Yeah, the syntax of that sentence was a bit off. But, um, so first of all, obviously, improved phonetic awareness, which was the big example that I listed earlier, where I finally really had to get the hang of distinguishing between b, p, and b, and b also in Hindi. And also just through the process of learning various other languages, one thing you learn pretty early on is that if you really want to get good at a language, you just have to be willing to speak, which is not a thing that I did with Shanghainese at all. I would just switch to Mandarin as soon as possible in school or whatever. Um, but once I decided I was actually going to learn Shanghainese, I would basically, I was living in New York, so there's people from all over the world. It's easy to practice all sorts of languages with. And every once in a while, I'd run into someone from Shanghai, and I would just be like, oh, Oh, you're from Shanghai too. I want to practice some Shanghainese with you. And I would just like go into it. I, I would know there were certain words that I might not be pronouncing correctly because I didn't know what they were. But there's distinctions that exist within Shanghainese that don't exist in Mandarin oftentimes. So you sometimes have to guess. Sometimes I would just try to recall why, what I'd heard my parents saying in the past and sort of that finally got me going with the Shanghainese language. I really started to be able to speak it, have like real conversations in this language that I'd grown up listening to all the time but never really spoke before. Um, also importantly in the case of Shanghainese is um, through learning various other obscure languages like say, I don't know, Haitian Creole, Lingala, whatever, uh, I'd gotten a lot better at finding obscure textbooks on the internet for various languages. So that helped a lot with Shanghainese as well because it's not that easy to find things to learn Shanghainese with. Um, so more recently, uh, January this year, I went back to Shanghai for somehow the first time in six years. I don't know how I'd managed to put that off since my parents currently live in Shanghai. Usually I would just, whenever I had the chance to go on vacation, I would go somewhere else and not to not home. Um, so it was a really interesting experience because obviously I'm surrounded by people speaking Shanghainese day in, day out. And I really found myself paying a lot more attention to the way people speak, the situations when people decided chose to speak Shanghainese over Mandarin. And one thing I noticed, and I mean I obviously knew this as a kid in some way, but not like in a way where I was actively paying attention to it. People speak Shanghainese a lot in Shanghai still. Like, we'd have a lot of family gatherings where literally not a word of Mandarin would be spoken except maybe to me and my brother and younger folks who older people sometimes assume might not speak, understand Shanghainese as well, that well. Um, other things that were interesting was uh, talking to older people who most people, a lot of people in Shanghai are like, second or third generation Shanghainese because it's a relatively young city. So a lot of people grew up speaking or hearing various other regional dialects. Whenever my mom would tell us a story about her grandpa, for example, she would always literally retell the story using his Ningbo accent and things like that. So, um, and of course also just listening to people speak, I would try to make sure 
I remembered, oh, that's how you pronounce that, or that's how you say that. I, I wasn't sure about that before, and things like that. And so learning of a whole bunch of other languages became very helpful in my attempt at reconnecting with my family's own Shanghainese language. But at the same time, afterwards, Shanghainese also sort of helped me move further on like, and gain a better appreciation for other languages as well. So one thing obviously, well not obviously, but significantly was that um, once I had actually gotten a more solid grasp of Shanghainese, I felt more confident, like, I felt like I had a better basis from which to actually try learning various other Chinese dialects. I had tried Cantonese before, it didn't really go that well. I gave it another shot. Um, if you were at the talk yesterday, you'll know that there are a lot of correlations that you can find between different dialects in terms of tone. It, knowing one dialect makes it easier to guess what the tone's gonna be in another one. So things like that help. I have studied Cantonese for a while, been doing Hokkien for maybe six months right now. And more generally, beyond just Chinese dialects, just having this lived experience of being in this sort of situation of diglossia that all of Shanghai is in where people speak more than one language and sort of switch between them based on the social context sort of gave me a better appreciation for a lot of other places where similar things happen. Obviously each case is somewhat different, like the Arabic dialects are not a perfect analogy for what goes on with Chinese dialects with Shanghai or say the way Javanese is used in Indonesia or various dialects in Italy and German and a lot of countries in Europe still have this where there's dialects and a standard way of speaking and people switch between them uh, based on the context. So really to get back to uh, the original chart I had, sort of, and I imagine this experience a lot of people in this room have also had, which is just you learn more about other languages and it sort of helps you gain a new appreciation for your own language and it's sort of, because ultimately it's just, they're all just languages. The circle is just everything builds on everything else. Everyone knows that once you've learned like say seven languages, the eighth one isn't as hard as your second one would have been. And at this point, this was my last slide, right? Yep. Um, I just wondering if anyone in the audience has any, had any similar experiences with a, a heritage language, a language their parents or grandparents spoke that they had to relearn, that they'd like to share? Anyone? All right, this is being filmed, so please speak to the mic. Right. Uh, similar to you, I um, have, I'm British and I have, um, ancestors and grandparents from the Celtic countries mm. and I th through that I got back into Welsh and then into Irish and Scots Gaelic and mm -hmm. so that was a similar sort of part. Great, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I was born in Romania, but uh, I moved to the U.S. when I was like two years old, so mm -hmm. uh, I, I remember nothing from there. Um, and very quickly, uh, English replaced basically my mm -hmm. my first language. Um, and I didn't really speak. I understood it when my parents spoke it to me, but then, yeah, I just uh, never responded in anything but English. Mm -hmm. And I guess after high school, I... Um, after I'd started learning German and, and kind of getting into linguistics, uh, learning a few things on my own, mm -hmm. I became more aware of, of uh, phonetics and, and how languages work in general. And then uh, I also became interested in actually learning my language uh, because I, it was something that I was not really ashamed of, but it just wasn't something that I really prioritized. So yeah, uh, it made me want to relearn it. And yeah, now, I, of course, I can speak it. So. Great, awesome. One more? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, li uh, like Andrew, uh, I have uh, roots in Wales, mm. although I grew up in Britain, in England, rather. 
and uh, so I relearned Welsh, which was my grandfather's first language. Uh, but I wanted to just ask you actually about something slightly different from right. that, which was that you mentioned that uh, the attitude to, that Shanghai's is not an endangered language, but mm -hmm. you've also said things about older people speaking to younger people in Mandarin and uh, Shanghai is being discouraged in the schools. Mm -hmm. Seems to me the situation sounds similar to what I found when mm -hmm. I went to Yogyakarta a couple of years ago, where mm -hmm. everyone's very relaxed about the state of the language. I, I imagine it was like this in Wales in the 19th century, when mm -hmm. Welsh was absolutely the dominant language. Then very, very rapidly, once you have these domain-specific, mm -hmm. you know, uh, limitations, a, a language can collapse. The, uh, there was no fear of that, no worry about that in Yogyakarta, people said, oh, our, the national language is Indonesian. Mm -hmm. uh, and to me, uh, I just wonder what, what your perspective would be on that. Right. So one reason I mentioned the thing about me not considering Shanghainese to be an endangered language is early on when I was talking to other people about the concept for this talk, um, people seemed to get the idea that Shanghainese was currently directly in danger, so I just sort of, sort of wanted to like pull back from that perspective. But also, yeah, I do feel like in Shanghai these days there is a sense that the, the local dialect is something worth preserving. It's part of the city's heritage. It wasn't so much that way when I was in school in the early 2000s, but um, for example, on my recent trip back to Shanghai, actually I noticed that nowadays in the buses in Shanghai, when they're announcing the stops, they do so in not just Mandarin and English, but also in Shanghainese. This is something that they introduced maybe a few years ago and they didn't used to have in Shanghai. And also there's always been, even when I was growing up there, uh, TV shows that about life in Shanghai that involve characters speaking Shanghainese, everything, as everything in China is, there's always like subtitles underneath. So I feel like, and Another aspect, I guess, is, uh, and this is also common across many dialects in China, is that the dialect is being preserved in traditional theater. Okay, I guess that's domain specific as well, so that is also. But I feel like there's becoming an increasing amount of awareness of Shanghainese as a thing that's worth preserving, and also an awareness that, yeah, people can actually just speak multiple languages. Emphasizing Shanghainese doesn't necessarily especially now that everyone mostly does speak Mandarin, it's possible to just have both. I mean, obviously, long term, yeah, Shanghainese is not going to be used by like the city government for official situations, so perhaps it's a bit tricky in that sense, but um, people are definitely starting to become more aware, or maybe it's just, I mean, it might just be because my relationship with Shanghainese was sort of like skewed by the whole like migration and return thing, whereas a lot of my classmates in China just, they speak Shanghainese all the time with each other, so they've always had a stronger connection to the language than I personally did because of the whole detour into the States as a kid. Mm -hmm. Yep. As I mentioned before, when we were talking, mm -hmm. I taught an uh, MBA course in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of my students had the opinion that since there's so many uneducated migrants in Shanghai, that speaking Shanghaiese is prestige. Mm -hmm. And uh, so those who can't are looked down upon. How do you think about that? That is, that is ac actually, that is another reason that I would I was reluctant to say, besides just the factual inaccuracy, I was reluctant to say that Shanghainese is endangered because it is sort of this prestige thing. I mean, sort of part of it's just the history of Shanghai as a city of like being the most like outward facing city in most of China. A lot of people in Shanghai look down on basically everyone else in the entire country <laughs> as uh, Xiaoning or like just country folk, even if you're from Beijing, you're a Beijing Xiaoning. You're just like exactly. Uh, that's so what, just, that's how they felt. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And more specifically, locally, um, as you might remember from the map earlier, like Wu was like directly bordering on Mandarin. And one group that's particularly drawn scorn from uh, Shanghainese over the ages are Mandarin speakers directly north of the Yangtze River. A lot of whom also moved to Shanghai to help with 
construction, like they're a large proportion of migrant workers and they're known as Gomponim, or like River North people. And so, yeah, there's definitely an interesting sort of prestige situation that's kind of complicated going on in Shanghai these days because obviously Mandarin is the official language, but at the same time, there's a, there's a prestige to being like from there. I've heard similar things about like Cantonese in Guangzhou to this day as well. So um, yeah, definitely it's sort of a, a tricky, like there's many layers to what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody did write one question in Slido. Uh, what are your tricks in finding le learning resources for more obscure languages? I mean, I don't want to incriminate myself on live video here, but um, if you, uh, I'm sure a lot of you know about websites where you can get textbooks and things for at very low cost from the internet and um, if you if you want to know more you can come and talk to me afterwards I mean another thing that I did do though since um I, I was recently doing my master's in journalism at Columbia so I had access to the libraries there so I just got the hang of like going to the library constantly and getting books on obscure languages from the yeah. library mm -hmm. concerning resources to Shanghaiese mm -hmm. I have two all right one is in Japanese it's a mm -hmm. it's a um, uh, Japanese publication, they do a lot of um, lesser languages. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the other is a very good one from, uh, I got in Taiwan. Mm. So, you know, it's, it's in, it's in Fanti, it's, a, it's in traditional characters because it's published right. there. Right. <clears throat> but they, they have a very good series on many of the languages of China. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I was able to get a book from, I think it was just a very generic title, like Let's Learn Shanghainese or something, that was in English and, it was both written in English and Mandarin, so like pe speakers of both of those languages could use it. Um, also, just a side note, uh, when I was in the library at my school looking for books for Shanghainese, I came across this Shanghainese textbook written in Russian in the 30s, and it was specifically targeted towards white Russian immigrants living in Shanghai at the time. So everything was written in like pre-revolutionary Cyrillic orthography and it was teaching people Shanghainese. And it was amazing. Also like the dialect was slightly different like almost 80 years ago. So just a side note, there's some material out there. Mm -hmm. Well, I have two points to uh, uh, related to your talk. Mm -hmm. One is the prestige thing that you said about the Shanghainese, so it's actually there as well in India. Mm -hmm. uh, you are uh, looked down up and up. Mm -hmm. uh, can you hear? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, how you pronounce your S, if you are like S, then you are lower class, mm -hmm. and if you are Sh, then you are urban upper class. Uh -huh. So. It's actually one thing which I think in the polyglot community we uh, we can try to uh, sensitize people that well there's nothing to be laughed at how you pronounce something mm -hmm. I think that kinds of that that's this kind of hinders the link mm. yeah 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 that just died all of a sudden yeah okay so uh, this based on phonetics and as a child I was fascinated I mean is there any sound that I cannot write with this well I couldn't think of any but then as I started learning Spanish I realized there are some hissing sounds like cerveza mm -hmm. zapatero mm -hmm. this 
this thing cannot be written. But nowadays, there is a point. Sorry? Oh, okay, device. so nowadays so, uh, there mm -hmm. is a way of writing it as well. It's not very uh, formally accepted, mm. but in Hindi or in the Indian languages, they have accepted. I mean, in in various communities, they accept adding a point right. below, like ja, mm -hmm. like j, and mm -hmm. they add a point below that to make it sound like z, right. like bonjour. Mm -hmm. That's what yeah. been done for like. Persian language exactly. as well yeah. for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, commenting again. Um, <clears throat> so you mentioned hen Hindi because of the distinction mm -hmm. with the T's and the D sounds. Yeah. Actually, you find that uh, straight across the southern part, you have it in Vietnamese. You have it uh, strongly in Thai, in Lao, mm -hmm. Nepali, Hindi, uh, etc. So also when I when I learned no I learned Nepali before Hindi and um I was fluent in Thai so mm -hmm. Thai helped me with the pronunciation of of the consonants in in, in Nepali and then later mm -hmm. Hindi mm -hmm. so yeah there is that connection but in general when you said you could not uh, hear the difference mm -hmm. um that surprises me some because uh -huh. if if you were listening to your parents speak Shanghainese, mm -hmm. and you understood them, then normally you're right. distinguishing between them. I guess. But you're doing it from context, as you said, mm -hmm. about stupid and speak, I see. Mm -hmm. Because when uh, two sounds, two similar sounds, mm -hmm. in, in one language, the sounds may make a difference. If it doesn't make a difference in the language that you're speaking, your neural networks subsume them, and you have to listen to it very clearly and pay mm -hmm. attention to separate it apart. Right, yeah. Um, in the specific case of Shanghainese, another thing is that usually the voiced ones, uh, and the, uh, correlate with low tone. So I think as long as I picked up the yeah, fact can, that the yeah, tone the was low. Yeah, context and the tones, yeah. you can mm -hmm. pick it up that yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, there's, I'm surprised you didn't use the difference between like in, like in Hindi or Nepali. Mm -hmm. uh, ta, and ta. They, my, I'm Tim, but people who speak Nepali always say Tim. Mm -hmm. They use ta. Because they can't, uh, the T in English is further above. The, the, T, in, the T in Hindi and the body is, is further. And the, the T in English is in between. And you hear Tim, to instead of T, Tim, right? That's what you hear as, as, you know, because it's not strong enough to be like a Hindi. It's mm -hmm. not strong enough to be what you wrote there. Yeah. It should be to is what you should write for that. Instead oh, right. of to, yes, that's you true. wrote the wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you use another one, it makes more sense. Yeah, yeah. You understand what I'm talking about, right? Talk, not yeah, yeah. Talk. Or, yeah. yeah the re retroflex ones. Yeah. Yeah. Slightly relevant in a in a different way. I teach Dutch, and well, you're, you're not always going to get a a speaker that's going to speak um, in perfect standard Dutch mm -hmm. and so I found a, a, a menu in uh, a Dutch dialect mm -hmm. and I'm going to be using that for some of my more intermediate um, students so they can see what kind of differences it makes which would make it easier to understand someone when there slips in some dialect words or stuff like that mm -hmm. and yeah I, yeah I totally i mean it's, it's a great. dialect situation in europe is actually a lot more i mean it's i guess it's not quite as bad as chinese or they're literally different languages but uh yeah it's an interesting situation that a lot of times like i was recently watching this tv show in uh, german where like people switch back and forth a lot between uh, berlin accent and standard accent but based on the social social context they're in and i was like oh wow that's like literally when they would be speaking shanghainese that's when they're speaking berlin or deutsch and uh, uh, when they'd be speaking mandarin they're speaking hochdeutsch and it's like yeah it's an interesting situation yeah, that's widespread sometimes mm -hmm. learning a, a dialect can mm -hmm. make it easier to learn the main lang the, the target language mm -hmm. um, when you're speaking to someone that well subconsciously yeah yeah people uh, in shanghai often uses some some bit of a dialect yeah slip in shanghainese words that are into their mandarin 
and they don't even realize that they're not standard Mandarin words because everyone in Shanghai uses them a lot of times. So yeah, definitely, like mm -hmm. dialect knowledge for foreign language speakers is also very useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I may, I thought I might add one trick for finding materials. Uh, if you find a decent book on Amazon, for example, uh, the people that take the time to write a con like write a review, mm -hmm. often they're quite interested in it, and you can comment. Mm -hmm. And I've done that before. I was searching for Kurmanji Kurd uh, Kurdish uh, yes. material, and then we we started communicating, and you know, and and just shared some books uh, in Google Drive. So uh, that's pretty mm -hmm. cool. Nice. Any other questions or stories? I All guess right. if not, then we can yeah. finish. Yeah. Thanks again. Good.